to Canada Game and wish them continued success in the future. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Marjorie Solos is no stranger to adversity and troubled times. The grade 12 student at Parkview Education Centre has seen her share. When she was in grade 7, she started experimenting with drugs and alcohol, and she was headed down a very dark path. Five years later, she is an IB student ready to graduate from high school and take on the world. She has aspirations of being a surgeon. In the meantime, she is working to make the world a better and warmer place. This past winter, she organized a clothing and blanket drive for Halifax's homeless population. People today often question where are the youth headed, and there is no question Marjorie is headed in the right direction. But it, fits, it fills me with great hope to know that there are young adults out there, like Marjorie, who show the, show the strength not only to battle her own problems, but to help others Order, battle please. theirs Order, please. Time well. allotted for member statements has expired. We'll move on to orders of the day with oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, uh, in answer to questions in this House, the Premier said that the first he'd heard of a possible health premium was from a reporter. At the same time, the Minister of Finance has been travelling the province talking about a health premium as a possible new source of revenue for the government. The Premier has implied that a health premium is not on the table. The Minister of Finance says it is. I'd like to ask the Premier which is it. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I uh, do do not believe that the Minister of Finance has any, said any such thing, uh, but uh, Mr. Speaker will introduce a budget next week and all Nova Scotians will get an opportunity to recognize that they have a government that is moving this province in the right direction and looking forward. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. And Mr. Speaker, I appreciate that, but my concern and the concern of many Nova Scotians is that an additional tax is going to be imposed on them when we already pay the highest taxes in the whole country. Premier said last week that Nova Scotians will see their fingerprints all over the budget. He was referring, I believe, to the tour that the Minister of Finance has been taking around the province, uh, where she raises the health premium as one of the options that's on the table. I'd like to ask the Premier if he understands the, the worry that Nova Scotians have, and will he assure them that he won't use a pre-budget tour to raise their taxes the way the NDP did with the HST. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure all Nova Scotians that this government will continue to do what we told them we would do in October of 2013, which is change the direction of this province. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to fix the structural challenges that successive governments have ignored. We'll continue to work with the private sector to drive job opportunities, Mr. Speaker. And then, like Mr. Speaker, the Conservative government of Alberta we will make sure Nova Scotians fully understand the direction we're going in and not through the back door. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One way to change the direction of the province would be actually answer the questions in question period instead of to avoid them, Mr. Speaker. One way to keep things the same is to constantly look for new ways to raise Nova Scotians' taxes. So I'll ask the Premier very directly. Will he confirm today for all Nova Scotians they will not be asking them to pay more in tax in the form of a health premium in the upcoming budget? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, over the last number of weeks we've had th that party and that leader fear-mongering across this province looking to find every opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to scare a few more votes in their direction. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance will stand in this house and deliver a platform and deliver a budget that has their Nova Scotia's fingerprints on it, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Order, Speaker, please. they will move. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's finally good to hear the member from Argyle Barrington stand up and say something. Mr. Speaker has been silent, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to his party reneging on the Yarmouth Ferry, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to fight for Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to vote for Nova Scotians. And, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance will deliver a budget that has Nova Scotians pointing in the right direction, and that is forward, Mr. Speaker, not looking backwards. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday at Law Amendments, Presenters made it clear this government unnecessarily wasted money fumbling around with health legislation 
while ignoring patient care. Now here we are, Mr. Speaker, months later, the same legislation being fast-tracked through this House to fix a legal mess created by the government. But Mr. Speaker, there's an even bigger problem, one the government doesn't want to acknowledge, and that's the working conditions of health care workers, especially nurses. So my question to the Premier is this. Why hasn't his government acknowledged the poor working conditions faced by nurses in our health care system? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've acknowledged many times the mess that the former government left us, and we're going to continue, Mr. Speaker, not only to improve the working conditions of nurses, Mr. Speaker, we're going to improve the working conditions of all hard-working Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, more than double the amount of nurses are retiring this year as compared to last, and nursing overtime hours are growing by the day. In fact, things have gotten so bad, Mr. Speaker, the government has had to bring in nurses from out of province just to cover shifts, something that certainly never happened under my watch, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is this. Why has he allowed nursing shortages to grow to almost crisis proportions in our province? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to, uh, first of all, congratulate the Minister of Health for continuing uh, to, to move our health care system forward, Mr. Speaker. Essential service legislation, Mr. Speaker, in this province so that Nova Scotians can rely on and re be reassured that the health care will be there for them when they need it, Mr. Speaker, no, what, no matter what's happening at the bargain table. Mr. Speaker, there's one other thing that didn't happen under that government, Mr. Speaker, and that was nurse-patient ratio, and they know why it didn't. <clears throat> The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, nurses have been telling us for months about the lack of respect they feel from that government, Mr. Speaker, and the nursing shortages that we face today were completely unavoidable, and the responsibility for them rests solely on the Premier's shoulders, Mr. Speaker. So my question is, when will the Premier listen to the nurses who are working in our health care system and deal with the staff shortages that are affecting patient care? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Let me begin by thanking all health care workers across this province, Mr. Speaker, who continue every day. Continue every day, Mr. Speaker, to respond to needs of Nova Scotians. And let me reassure the leader of the New Democratic Party that the Minister of Health and this government will continue to be focused on patients as we restructure the health care system, Mr. Speaker, that that government was unprepared to deal with. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Ontario, and Prince Edward Island have all signed on to join the National Securities Regulator. They are working together to cut red tape and promote jobs and investment in their provinces. This is something the Premier has talked about doing here, so I would like to ask him why has he rejected such an obvious way to cut red tape and promote jobs and investment here in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we haven't outright rejected that. We're continuing to talk to the federal government uh, to ensure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the revenue that we're, we would potentially lose in this province would be protected. And, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that the voice from Nova Scotia is on a national regulator. How can it be wrong that we're standing up for the, for the people of this province when we're building what should be a national network? The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Premier is confusing talking about something with actually doing something. We now know today, Mr. Speaker, that the province of Prince Edward Island has made an arrangement with the federal government to receive $35 million in funding, five years' worth of lost revenue, to join a national regulator, which would actually cut red tape here in Nova Scotia and promote investment and jobs in this province. Premier says they're talking about doing it. That is good news. Will he update the House on when we might hear an announcement about Nova Scotia joining the National Securities Regulator? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, we'll continue to negotiate with the federal government. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to negotiate, ensuring that we get the best possible deal for Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture. 
Mr. Speaker, last week the Liberal government announced a 507% tax increase on food truck operators. The fee went from $38 to $193. The food truck industry has grown quickly in North America and offers entrepreneurs an opportunity to open business with few barriers for entry. That tax barrier just increased by 507%. At a select Nova Scotia event in November, the minister himself said that food trucks help create conditions which benefit local food producers, and I will table that, Mr. Speaker. In the Chronicle Herald, Natalie Chevier, an owner of a food truck enterprise, claimed the that the department did not consult regarding this increase while only given six days' notice before it took effect, and I will table that too, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister is this, Mr. Speaker. Why didn't he take the time to consult with small business owners and operators who work in this industry every day with this tax increase? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, that's a very important question to all of us. And indeed, uh, we are working towards a further cost uh, allocation in our department to get to true costs and doing these inspections. And we're moving to a more closer cost recovery on these inspections, and that's why the reason the fees went up. The Honourable Member for Kings North on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister is aware, anyone in Nova Scotia who wants to operate a food service facility must have a permit. According to the information on the Department of Agriculture website, food establishment permits are valid from April 1st of one year to March 31st of the, second, the following year, and I will table that. Except this year, Mr. Speaker. An update on the provincial website says there has been a delay in issuing renewal notices this year and that the Department is extending current, periods, current permits to April 30th, and I will table that, Mr. Speaker. Interesting, considering the increased permit fees come into effect on April 1st. My question, Mr. Speaker, for the Minister is this. Will the Minister come clean with Nova Scotians about, about what specifically caused these so-called delays? Or will you admit that delaying the renewal permit renewals was planned so the government could take advantage of the increase in user fees? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, this year uh, there were some adjustments we knew were going to be made in the, uh, in the fees, again, towards food safety, and uh, move closer to cost recovery on these. So we presently are about 37 percent of our total cost is recovered from inspections. And we don't want the general public to have to pay for that when food safety is so important. And that's why it was extended to the end of April this year. It's a one-time thing. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question to you is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, over the last year, we have seen... The dub double the number of nurses retire. At the QE2 alone, 33 nurses have retired since January, where there already were 40 vacancies in all of the hospital's critical care areas. But, Mr. Speaker, this should not be a surprise to the Premier. He was warned about a nursing shortage last year, but, Mr. Speaker, the Premier was too busy picking fights with health care workers to hear the warnings, I think. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is, why is the Premier ignoring nurses about the growing problem of understaffing they face in our hospital? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to inform all members of this House uh, that we've continued to, to hire new nurses in this province. Ninety-two percent of the nursing grads in this province get hired by, 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 by the Government of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. We're encouraged by that. Uh, we're looking forward to, Mr. Speaker, continue to build on that uh, and make sure uh, that we have the proper level of staffing in all floors across this province, Mr. Speaker, and everyone knows. Uh, that including the president of the nurses union, Mr. Speaker, who suggested there should not be a patient uh, uh, nurse patient ratio, Mr. Speaker, because you need to be flexible in order to meet the needs of the patients on floors across this province, and we need to w make sure that management and the nurses that are working on that floor have the flexibility to provide the services required in the individual institutions from one end of this province to the other. The honourable leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, flexibility should not mean working short staff, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Chronicle Herald reported comments made 
by the Interim Manager of Recruitment Services at the QE2, which outlined the Department of Health's directive for the hospital to hire travel nurses to be flown in from outside of the province to help fill vacancies at the hospital. And the manager described the situation saying, although at present our highest demand is in critical care areas, we do anticipate a similar need might arrive in the near future in all specialty areas, both at the QE2 and other sites. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, how much worse will the nursing shortage get, have to get before the Premier starts listening and addressing this problem? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, just to, uh, to uh, remind the House what I said previously, we hired 90 per cent of the nursing grads in this province, Mr. Speaker, to work uh, from one end of this province to the other, continuing to work. Uh, the Minister of uh, the Minister of Health is continuing to work uh, to, up, uh, to upgrade the nursing strategy to ensure that we have health care workers across this province. Mr. Speaker, I'm amazed. I'm amazed, Mr. Speaker, how much work he's been able to do considering the mess that government left in. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of ERDT. Mr. Speaker, to date, Nova Scotia taxpayers have put over $40 million into the Yarmouth Ferry. The boat hasn't even set sail for the 2015 season and already was spent $2 million, and the government refuses to tell taxpayers the details. Mr. Speaker, one of the clauses in the 2015 contract stated the company shall use reasonable commercial efforts to employ Nova Scotia residents and purchase products and services from Nova Scotia and work cooperatively in an open and transparent ma manner with the province in an effort to maximize the economic development opportunities for Nova Scotians. And I will table that, Mr. Speaker. My, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is, will the Minister provide an update today on how much has been spent on goods and services purchased in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd remind the member that all the details uh, regarding the Yarmouth Ferry have been posted online. The contract uh, has been posted online for all Nova Scotians to see. Uh, any disbursements that have been made as part of the agreement are posted online as well. The company is currently negotiating with a number of different service providers and I would expect that there will be more information in the very near future that will answer the member's questions. The Honourable Member for Kings North on his final supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday on a design website, a U.S.-based advertising company called Saltwater Creative posted pictures of their work for Novastar, an ad campaign. You've never seen Nova Scotia like this, and I will table that, Mr. Speaker. More searching on Nova Star Facebook page indicated that Saltwater Creative, based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, is the company's ad agency. The picture, and I will table a picture of the CEO and their rep from Facebook. My question for the minister is this. What does he have to say to qualified Nova Scotia advertising representatives whose own tax dollars are being used to fund an American-based advertising firm? <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Mr. Speaker, Novastar itself has a requirement to be able to advertise in the northeastern United States market to try to attract more visitors to Nova Scotia and more passengers on the ferry. As well, the Nova Scotia Tourism Agency has also been working on exploring more opportunities in that northeastern United States market. Last year's numbers were some of the highest numbers that we have seen in quite some time, and we're looking forward to building on that. But what I would remind the member as well is that it would appear that the company is having some success because last year, throughout the entire sailing season, there was a total of 19 uh, bus bookings for the whole year. Uh, as of today, there are over 80 bus tours booked to come to Nova Scotia this year. Honourable Member for Pitco Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Mr. Speaker, teaching days lost to snowstorms and the actual structural safety to schools in Nova Scotia has become a huge issue for school boards and parents this winter due to the volumes of snow which has fallen on school rooftops. One day in late February, there were more than 50 schools alone within the Halifax Regional School Board suffering from leaking rooftops. And today, after being closed for several days, five schools finally opened because school board officials were concerned about the weight load on those five schools. 
Minister is aware of a letter I wrote to her in late February, which I will table this afternoon concerning this significant issue. My question to the Minister, can the Minister please clarify for all members exactly how many schools in Nova Scotia have been visited by a building inspector and been declared safe from a roof collapse? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And, of course, the question is timely, not only for schools, but for all of our uh, public buildings and even for our personal property due to the severe weather conditions that we have had this winter. Uh, our department is working very closely with the school boards. As the member would know, school boards have the responsibility for the facilities uh, under their jurisdiction, and they are vigilant as to what is safe the safety of students, the safety of staff, and anybody who's in the building is a number one priority, and I commend them for closing buildings if they believe the conditions are unsafe. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are aware of unusual amounts of uh, snow which have fallen this winter, and it appears the snow is not going away very quickly. With any amount of heavy snow, the school rooftops can only become more structurally unsafe. <laughs> If there were 50 schools with leaks in their roofs in Halifax in late February, it would be worthy of the Minister noting how many schools in total across Nova Scotia were reporting a similar difficulty. The Minister has to be cognizant of the fact this is an issue that required and still requires the immediate attention of herself and all school boards across Nova Scotia. My question to the Minister, <coughs> is the Minister able to provide any kind of reassurance to parents today that all Nova Scotia schools are structurally safe as a result of site inspections by building inspectors and engineers. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I will uh, uh, table the response that I gave to the member when uh, he did uh, send me some correspondence. He has tabled his letter. I will also table my response. But in that, I spoke specifically to the safety issue and to the uh, vigilance that I know our operations staff uh, have in all of our boards, and, and I do commend them. I would also like to say that we have sent a message out to all boards that we have put aside $15 million again in a maintenance capital budget, and that will, I believe, address some of the concerns that that uh, schools have and boards have with leaking roof and uh, the need for roof repairs. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. ICU beds at the QE2 have been closed for weeks now due to a shortage of critical care nurses. Nurses in one unit alone estimate thousands of hours of overtime has been worked since January 1st. For example, in one day, there had been as many as 7 out of 18 people in one unit working overtime, Mr. Speaker, almost half the staff in that unit. While campaigning during the last election, the Premier said his party's plan will address <coughs> issues around nurse overtime. So through you to the Minister of Health, where is the McNeil's government's plan to address nurse overtime? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And what I can say to the uh, member uh, from sackville Cobbequid. Uh, is that uh, this, uh, in this particular uh, year, uh, the, uh, the QE2 health sciences uh, have been uh, challenged, especially uh, in the ICU and a couple of the other specialty uh, units, and uh, training uh, enough uh, nurses uh, when we do have uh, high numbers uh, of, uh, of retirements, and that we can expect and anticipate uh, for at least about a 10-year period. And uh, that's why uh, we have increased uh, the number of seats uh, to about 400 in the nursing school in anticipation uh, of this. Uh, we see this as a, a short-term issue. The nursing strategy in particular uh, will address uh, this and other nursing issues in the province. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid on his final supplementary. A high number of nurses retiring. I wonder why, Mr. Speaker, I wonder why. Uh, nurses are paying the price of constantly being asked to work overtime. Experienced nurse Janice Nicholson says she feels guilty turning down overtime shifts. She worries that her co-workers will be working short staff if she says no. Most of all, she worries about how saying no will impact her patients who require a high level of care. Yet Janice knows she has, has to uh, uh, consider her own health uh, as she accepts these shifts, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Minister, what is the McNeil government doing to ensure nurses like Janice aren't constantly asked to choose between their own health and their patients? 
The Honourable Minister of Health. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, what I can tell the member opposite is that uh, you know we we have uh, a good number of nurses uh, ready to retire. 65 is not a bad age, and we have about 350 nurses in Nova Scotia who are 65 or over currently in the system. And I don't think things can be all that bad because last year 133 nurses came from other provinces into Nova Scotia. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Picto West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of ERDT. The recent announcement from the Nova Scotia Tourism Agency regarding the closure of the Picto Visitor Information Centre has been devastating for our community. A total of 12 good-paying rural jobs have been dissolved. Provincial visitor information centres will decrease to six from eight. There has been clear indication from CEO Patrick Sullivan of the Nova Scotia Tours Agency that within 10 years all VICs will be phased out. My question is, can the Minister please explain to Nova Scotians and especially to those directly related to the tourism industry what the plan is in order to fulfill the audacious one Nova Scotia goal of doubling tourism revenue from $2 billion annually <coughs> to $4 billion, while phasing out the service that our provincial VICs provide? Thank yep. you. The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Speaker, we've listened very closely to the Independent Board of Nova Scotia Tourism Agency who told our government that the role of government is to bring visitors to our province. Uh, we have seen a 40% reduction over the last 10 years in the amount of visitors who actually go to a visitor information centre. Uh, while the member indicates that there previously was eight visitor information centres run by the government in Nova Scotia, uh, I would also remind her that there are over 50 visitor information centres from one end of our province to the next, which are run by municipalities, tourism associations and chambers of commerce, for example. So there is still ample opportunity uh, for uh, visitors to be able to access information, but the message from the industry was loud and clear. Government's role is in attracting more visitors to our province so that we can meet the Ivany goal of doubling our tourism revenues in the next 10 years. The Honourable Member for Picto West on her final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I will thank the Minister for his answer. Last week, I learned that another colossal change is taking place within the Nova Scotia Tourism Agency. Many of our seasonal businesses and museums received, received a letter indicating that distribution of our Provincial Doers and Dreamers Guide will no longer be distributed free of charge, creating another financial burden for the loss of those in the tourism industry, especially to our non-profit museums that require necessary literature to help service our tours. In fact, no longer can anyone in Nova Scotia have a travel guide mailed to them free of charge. Will the Minister please tell us what the total cost savings is for this unfortunate decision and where the money will be relocated, if at all? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I, I certainly thank the member for the question. And just like with the VICs, the Doers and Dreamers Guide, fewer and fewer visitors to our province are actually asking for a paper copy of the guide. It's quite expensive to publish. More and more people are accessing that information online. Uh, we'll certainly do our best to ensure that those who need them will still be serviced with them. But it's, it's interesting because just uh, last week, I joined my colleagues from King South in meeting with the Annapolis Valley Chamber of Commerce who runs a visitor information center and they said one of their biggest frustrations was at the end of the season having to rent out a truck to take the excess amounts of publications sent to them that were never used having to take them to the waste facility and the financial burden that that was placing on them of receiving documentation which was not necessary and not being used. Mr. Speaker, the days of that type of waste taking place are over in Nova Scotia. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Sackville, Cobbequid. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This time last year, nurses in the capital region were here at the Legislature pleading with the Premier to address their concerns about patient safety. At the time, the Premier acknowledged concerns around staffing and promised, promised, Mr. Speaker, to address the workplace issues. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, a year later, things only seem to have gotten worse. An unusual number of nurse retirements are happening. Intensive care beds are closed and private travel nurses are being flown in for the first time in a decade because they are so short staffed at the QE2. So through you to the Premier, I'd like to ask the Premier, why has the Premier allowed patient safety and staffing concerns in the capital region 
to go unaddressed for an entire year. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I totally disagree with the premise of the Honourable Member's question, Mr. Speaker. Any issues that have been brought to the Minister of Health, the Minister of Health has directed to the employer to work uh, to ensure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the concerns being brought forward by Healthcare Workers Province are addressed in a meaningful way. Uh, he knows, uh, Mr. Speaker, as a former Minister of Health, as a former Minister of the Executive Council, that no government, regardless of the political stripe, would not listen to concerns of people who work on their behalf. This is just nothing more than trying to generate some political rhetoric. Mr. Speaker, when he was Minister, when he was minister of Health, he should have dealt with the issue instead of leaving it for this government to deal with. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Sackville Cobbequid, on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we, we treated workers fairly, especially health care workers. We talked with them with respect. We didn't bring the heavy hand that the Liberal government brought Order, forward, please. Mr. Speaker. Shame on them. Shame on them all. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid has the floor. I should say it again. I should say it again, Mr. Speaker. Critical care nurses are reporting that they're almost constantly short-staffed, Mr. Speaker. More and more they're being forced to care for twice as many patients as they normally would, a situation that puts patient care at risk. They told the Premier, they told the government that last year. So I'd like to ask the Premier again, and maybe he'll answer it. Prior to getting elected, he said he had a plan to address nursing shortages. Can the Premier deliver and show the plan to Nova Scotia today? <coughs> The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to remind uh, the Honourable Member and uh, the member of, her caucus, of his caucus who continues to, uh, Mr. Speaker, heckle in this house. The fact of the matter is that over 90 percent of the nursing graduates in this province are being hired by the province of Nova Scotia. The Minister of Health just indicated there were 130 plus people who moved into Nova Scotia who were nursing, Mr. Speaker, wanting to work in the province of Nova Scotia. Is there more work to do? Mr. Speaker, is there more work to do? Of course there is. And I want to ensure all health care workers that they have a government that wants to work with them. But, Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility to ensure the sustainability of the health care system in this province. And throwing more money at it like the New Democratic Party did isn't the simple solution that they want to make it out to be. Mr. Speaker, asking to be in government means showing leadership and, def and defending all Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, not just those, Mr. Speaker, that sit in the union leadership. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Struck a nord, struck a chord there. On more than one occasion, I have asked the Minister of Health about the 100-day review uh, announced last January in Continuing Care Services. Now, it's been 425 days, to be exact, since the review was first announced. That's more than four times longer uh, than originally announced, so I don't know if we're talking about lunar years or dog years or whatever we're talking about here. So the last time that I asked the Minister about this, I informed him of a, of a foie pop that stated the evaluation could take as long as 12 to 14 months, well beyond the 100 days as the Minister promised. So if 12 to 14 months is accurate, the Minister should have it uh, on his desk by now. So which is it? Can the Minister tell us when we can expect to see the updated continuing care strategy? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And what the member opposite uh, knows very well is that we said we would announce a continuing care uh, update uh, within the uh, first 100 days of our government, uh, get it underway, get an advisory uh, committee in place, and that work, uh, Mr. Speaker, is well underway. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. All right, I don't know, maybe that's Jupiter years, Pluto years. How long is it going to be? I mean, a 100-day review um, that's going to take 14, 12 to 14 months uh, to provide. Uh, it's given you plenty of time, uh, given the minister plenty of time to, to have this uh, for. There are 2,500 Nova Scotians waiting on the list for placement in long-term care facilities. There are seniors that have worked and contributed, contributed to this province their whole lives. They deserve better than this. The minister should tell families, should not tell families it will be 100 days until a new plan is done or anything like that, when it's actually be more than a year. It's cruel to give desperate families false hope. Enough's enough. When is the minister going to release the strategy and stop leaving struggling families in the dark? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, what the member uh, from uh, Argyle Barrington knows very well is that uh, we said within 100 days we would initiate uh, a, a committee, an advisory group, uh, to, uh, to review the continuing care strategy, first introduced in 2006, uh, needed a refresh. Uh, he knows very well that we've announced uh, one major part of that, and that is on March the 2nd, uh, we said we would be looking at uh, changing the entry into nursing homes so that those uh, had, were at high risk, uh, those with high needs, would be the first to get a nursing home bed. We've started to uh, roll that out. The rest of the strategy, as he well knows, will come uh, during the coming year. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Mr. Speaker, when healthcare workers at Capital Health witness safety issues, they are told to call the safe line. The NDP caucus have received a transcript of calls to the safe line, which I'll table, Mr. Speaker. An RN called on February 14th with grave concerns about low staffing levels resulting in, I quote, very unsafe conditions. But so far, Mr. Speaker, this RN's concerns have been ignored. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Health, when will the nurses uh, calls to the safe line about patient safety at Capital Health be addressed. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I know uh, when I was a uh, health critic on two occasions, uh, I was called to the QE2 uh, to take a look uh, firsthand uh, at the, uh, the staff shortage. Uh, uh, this is while the, uh, the, the former government uh, was in office. This is not a, a new problem. It's not a new issue. But it is one that we do ask uh, that, yes, uh, management uh, be involved with nurses to correct. However, uh, uh, doing a scan across the country, uh, very often there are nurse-instituted initiatives uh, that help uh, deal with some of those uh, uh, too frequent uh, shortages of, of nurses uh, on floor, where, especially where the acuity is very high. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid on his final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Maybe I wasn't clear. Uh, that was February 14, 2015, that that call went into the safe line. The RN who called the safe line was reporting from 5.1 at the QE2. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that's the cardiovascular ICU. As she said that this is an ongoing issue, so hopefully things will change because if a patient got into trouble, there would be no nurse to look after them. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, to the Minister, why is the Minister of Health ignoring nurses' concerns about patient safety even at the cardiovascular intensive care unit at the QE2 uh, hospital? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. He knows very well that uh, uh, we aren't uh, ignoring any of those uh, problems or concerns. Uh, there are times when there are gaps in the training uh, for the very specialized uh, care. Uh, at, the, uh, at the ER, uh, at, uh, at cardiac uh, care, also in the ICU. Uh, these are very specialized, very intense uh, nursing environments, and uh, sometimes the training uh, of those staff uh, are, are don't quite keep pace uh, with, uh, with retirements, and uh, that sometimes indeed can be an issue. The Honorable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On any given day, emergency rooms all over the province are closed. Frequent closures are plaguing Shelburne, North Sydney, Parsboro, Middleton. And Dr. John Ross has been once again enlisted by the government to help fix the problem. The NDP ignored the bulk of Dr. Ross's recommendations from his 2010 report. And to this date, the government has done nothing to address the problems of Dr. Ross's recommendations. There's no real mandate given to Dr. Ross or deliverables. It's hard to believe that this government is doing anything to keep emergency rooms open. So my question to the Minister of Health, does the Minister not believe that this problem warrants urgent action and that Nova Scotians, at the very least, deserve some timelines? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and again, uh, we know that uh, uh, there has been some very good work uh, done uh, with uh, trying to keep uh, emergency rooms uh, open. The, the CEC model uh, is, uh, is, is certainly supporting. Uh, however, it's not emergency care. Emergency rooms uh, were closed. Uh, we now 
uh, have uh, Dr. Ross advising uh, uh, for the next group of uh, emergency rooms that uh, do need to be addressed. And once again, uh, uh, the, the main feedback we are getting is that, first of all, address a primary care and primary care and new models of delivery as we modernize the system uh, are indeed going, going into uh, action. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition on his final supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer, but, you know, still doesn't get the urgency of the situation right now. The Minister has not provided Dr. Ross with a timeline, no recommend requirements to produce a report. He said there will be periodic updates. It doesn't sound like the Minister is really committed to, uh, to a solution. While in opposition, the now Premier criticized the NDP government for failing to act on emergency rooms and urged using Dr. Ross as a cover. He said they hired, quote unquote, good quote at the time, they hired Dr. John Ross for one reason and that's to hide behind. I'll uh, table those documents. They've uh, set out no clear outcomes for Dr. Ross and has a willy-nilly -nilly timeline. Meanwhile, a valuable 2010 report is gathering dust on the Minister of Health's desk. Is the Minister not once again hiding behind Dr. Ross to give the appearance that the government's doing something? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, maybe I'm uh, preempting uh, the, the, uh, the, member, uh, the member from Cape Breton's uh, uh, question uh, that he'll bring along some time, and that is uh, an update on Northside and what I can tell the House that uh, Northside General is one of those uh, hospitals that, uh, uh, that absolutely uh, needs to change the, the model that they currently have there. Uh, that work is uh, now underway. And uh, we hope within a matter of months that uh, uh, we'll have a, a CEC uh, uh, in that particular uh, area. Or I guess we should really frame it, as Mary Jane Hampton said, and that is continuing care centers because there is not emergency care uh, in the CECs. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker has been alluded that the persistent closures at the Northside General are wearing on the people in our community. The longer we wait for a solution and some leadership from the government, the more anxious the people are becoming. The Minister recently said there can't be three hours in Cape Breton and a regional hospital. He'll be happy to know, Mr. Speaker, that they're closed so often that no one in Cape Breton believes there's three ERs in an emergency hospital right now. He plans to have Dr. Ross look at a solution for Cape Breton. He gives him no timeline, no report, and no feedback beyond periodic updates. The people of North Sydney are sick of the government's neglect. My question is, will the Minister make Northside General a priority for this government? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the uh, member knows, uh, I, I took his invitation to go down to Northside, uh, meet with uh, staff there. Uh, there is, in fact, a, a great deal of change uh, needed at Northside and uh, in the community to, uh, to develop uh, collaborative care practices and to get uh, primary care uh, operating, uh, in particular, uh, at, the, uh, at Northside General itself. Many of the, uh, of the requirements that the, that the emergency room uh, have, in fact, can be uh, served uh, in the community and with a different model of care, and that, in fact, is now underway uh, to being corrected. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount, on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, he also committed to come back and have a public meeting with the people of the Northside, and I hope that we can hold the, the Minister to that. In a, public, in a meeting with some of the public afterwards, he said he would come back and discuss the, the changes to the Northside General with those people. Now, Mr. Speaker, rumors of the future of Northside General continue to spread as the government turns a blind eye to these problems. And it sounds like already he's made up his mind that one of these ERs will be closed and reorganized. It sounds like it's the Northside General. Mr. Speaker, it's good that we'll be reorganized, but he's also said that CECs aren't a substitute for emergency care. So can I ask the Minister, what changes is the Minister planning for the ERs, and will he be upfront with the people of the North Side about it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite knows that uh, I have no problem coming back to address the concerns of his community or, uh, or any community in the province as far as that goes. Uh, we, we know that the, uh, the emergency room uh, indeed uh, uh, needs, uh, needs changing uh, at, uh, at Northside. 
uh, but uh, the one thing that the member opposite and all those uh, needing emergency health care uh, at Northside is that we have one of the best uh, ambulance and emergency services in North America. The Honourable Member for Toronto Bible Hill Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia's film and TV industry adds approximately $125 million to our economy each year, bringing work and worldwide attention to our province. It's responsible for the creation of thousands of jobs, and this success would not be possible without the support the industry receives through the Provincial Film Tax Credit, a fact the McNeil government acknowledged in its platform when it promised to extend the credit for a period of five years. Today, however, Mr. Speaker, I'm concerned that the future of our industry may be in jeopardy after last week the Finance Minister criticized the tax credit in front of the Halifax Chamber of Pro Commerce. So I'm curious, Mr. Speaker, given the Ivany Report's recommendation to grow our creative economy, why is the Minister openly discussing cuts to a successful program like the t film tax credit? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer the question from the men member opposite. And, Mr. Speaker, in my ch uh, chamber speech last week, I simply pointed out the value of the credit and a little bit about how it works in our province. It's valued at $24 million. In fact, it was more last year because we dealt with the backlog of, of uh, applications that had been sitting there prior to our election. And we, were, we have, have also uh, worked with the industry. I met them as recently as yesterday. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River on a final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm glad to hear the Minister is so supportive of this tax credit. Uh, and in a September 2014 Coast article, Mark Allman, chair of the Nova Scotia Motion Picture Industry Association, said, and I quote, if the McNeil government were to make any change to the film tax credit, it could have a damaging effect. So to the Minister, to help calm any anxiety being felt by those who earn a living in the film, television and animation industries in this province, can the Minister please outline any changes that she may be considering to the film tax credit? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that what she's speaking about is a budget item and that we would be unable to speak about that today. At this time, the budget will be delivered on April 9th. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, Northern Pulp has indicated they plan to appeal the industrial approval issued to them by the Department of Environment. They claim that some of the targets are unrealistic and, in more than one case, immeasurable. They have asked on more than one occasion to sit down with the Department and speak with the scientists who developed the standards so they could share information in the hopes of finding a solution or better understanding how the standards were reached. The Department has refused to share their information. A question to the Minister, Mr. Speaker. Why hasn't the Department of Environment provided any serious or substantial evidence to support its position. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, clearly, uh, the concerns of the constituents and the, the people of uh, Picto uh, and the Picto area have uh, been heard uh, loud and clear by this, uh, this government, Mr. Speaker, over the past uh, year. Uh, with respect to uh, the concerns being raised by the member opposite, I'm not exactly sure what he's uh, referring to because, in fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, Employees within the uh, Department of Environment have met uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, both in person, uh, through uh, phone and written correspondence, uh, to uh, continue the dialogue with uh, the, uh, the proponent. So again, I, I'm not exactly sure where the uh, premise of the uh, question has come from. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre on his final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm uh, relating to recent requests to uh, talk to the Department about uh, issues concerning the IA. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the industrial approval is approximately 66 pages of so you must do this and you must do that without any rationale or context regarding how they should do it. My question to the Minister, where is the justification and rationale from your department with regard to the implementation of the IA? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I guess to uh, the point uh, the, the member opposite uh, indicated that uh, he was referring to uh, recent requests uh, to discuss the IA, if he'd uh, be happy to submit uh, more details with respect to uh, who the recent request was made by and, and what that recent uh, refers to, so I can actually uh, follow up specifically. I'd be happy to do that with the, uh, the member. Uh, with respect to uh, the rationale, I guess, uh, as far as providing details on to how to uh, implement, Mr. Speaker, I'd, uh, happy to educate uh, the member opposite uh, on our regulatory role, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, not a general common practice for regulatory bodies to be prescriptive in uh, the regulatory directions, uh, but rather that we set the parameters that must be achieved. It's up to the proponents to identify the most uh, efficient and effective ways to achieve those uh, objectives and uh, as defined by our department, Mr. Speaker. I assure the member and the residents of Picto that uh, the work that we do is based on evidence and uh, that, in fact, the standards that we've established are evidence-based. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture. The Department of Environment is proposing to add a fee to the purchase of off-road tires. This would add another fee for our farmers who would have to pay a fee for tractor tires. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is this. Has the Minister of Agriculture told the Minister of Environment that he opposes increasing costs for Nova Scotian farmers? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Oh, the Honourable Minister of the Environment, sorry. Agriculture. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions by members. Two ministers has expired. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, would you please call the order of business, government business. We'll now call government business. Mr. Speaker, I would move that you now leave the chair and that the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole on bills. The House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. The House will recess for two minutes while we get set up.